Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our panel discussion, Asian Futurisms, which is part of a, our current film series, Alternate Realities, Science Fiction from Across Asia. Uh, just to give you some background on this program, I got the idea for this series after seeing a number of recent films popping up at film festivals, from the, mostly from East Asia, the Middle East, uh, that use the tropes and themes of science fiction in very unorthodox, interesting ways, uh, and, and in a lot of ways to comment on our own times. Uh, and rather than the sort of sci-fi epics that we imagine from the genre, these are more independent films. Uh, one programmer dubbed them lo-fi sci-fi, uh, which sort of makes them even more kind of creative to my mind. And it struck me as a trend that was worth uh, worth exploring. So we put together the series in today's discussion to to do that. Uh, I'll, I'll begin by giving brief bios of all of our panelists. You can find uh, longer ones on our website. Uh, Sophia Almaria is an artist, writer, and filmmaker. She studied comparative literature at the American University in Cairo and oral and visual cultures at Goldsmiths University of London. For the past few years, she has been carrying out research around the concept of Gulf futurism. Her primary interests are the isolation of individuals via technology and reactionary Islam, the corrosive elements of consumerism and industry, and the erasure of history and the blinding approach of a future no one is ready for. Uh, her two short video works, The Future Was Desert, parts one and two, are included in the program and are streaming through December 11th. Maddie Doe is a, a Laotian filmmaker based in Laos. She directed The Long Walk, which was part of the first part of the uh, streaming series. It's no longer streaming with the series now, unfortunately, but we're glad to have her here. Uh, and she'll be talking about her film as well. Uh, Larissa Sensor and Soren Lind are the co-directors of two films in the series, In the Future They Ate from the Finest Porcelain and In Vitro, which explore the dialectics between myth and historical narrative and use science fiction to address social and political issues. Larissa is originally from East Jerusalem, Soren is from Denmark, uh, and their work has been widely exhibited in museums, galleries, and film festivals worldwide. Chuang Min Wee's work draws on the landscape of his homeland of Vietnam, uh, his childhood memories and his, and his historical context of his country. His second feature, The Treehouse, is included in the series. Uh, it uh, merges science fiction, uh, documentary, and the essay film genres to, among other things, show how the Vietnam War affected two groups of indigenous people in Vietnam. And uh, Sheng Zhe Zhu is a filmmaker and producer from China, now based in Chicago. Her third film, Present.Perfect, is perhaps the least sci-fi of the films in the program, but to my mind, uh, at least, it shows how technology, in this case, live streaming, is making our own world resemble science fiction more and more, whether you consider that utopian or dystopian is a matter of interpretation, I suppose. Uh, it won the Tiger Award at the International Film Festival Rotterdam, the Grand Prize at the RIDM Montreal International Documentary Festival, and the Spotlight Award at the 2020 Cinema I Honors. And finally, our moderator today is Samira al Qasim. She teaches film and video studies at George Mason University. Her publications include the co-authored book, The Cinema of Muhammad Malas, Visions of a Syrian Auteur, and chapters in Cinema of the Arab World, Contemporary Directions in Theory and Practice, Refocus the Films of Jocelyn Saab, and Gaza on Screen, which is forthcoming next year. She also co-edits the Paul Graves Studies in Arab Cinema. Uh, and I got to know her when we collaborated on an Arab film series several years ago at her former uh, place of work, the Jerusalem Fund. So welcome everyone. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, feel, uh, for the audience, feel free to type questions into the Q&A, but right now I will turn things over to Samira, Samira al Qasim. Thank you, Tom. That was a wonderful introduction. Um, so I'm just gonna launch into two rounds of questions for everybody on the panel. And then I'm going to start uh, going with two questions per each panelist. And Tom is going to step in and help me out with that in some areas. And if there's time, then we'll return to some general questions. So I'm gonna start off with um, uh, futurism. So futurism has been described in other contexts, Afrofuturism, indigenous futurism, Gulf futurism. As part of a response to the Anthropocene age, to settler colonialism, occupation, exile, racism, capitalism, imperialism, and extractive economies, among many other things. So can each of you discuss how your work responds to any of those things? And maybe to start off with, um, why don't we start off with Sophia, because I see her in the box next to me. Hi, happy to be here in the box. Um, I guess uh, I'm here to talk about Gulf Futurism. That's the um, particular version of that word that I um, have been attached to. 
the reason that I um, used the word future, well, actually, I have I have very different opinions now about the word futurism or even the future as a place we might end up than I did when I was first thinking around that. Originally, the idea of um, go futurism was very much something to do with think, almost seeing the Gulf as a projection of what will what might happen elsewhere in the world as um, as environmental change accelerates and as deserts uh, as desertification uh, continues and like especially the stratification of of class and of um, all different sort of injustices uh, become more and more um, pronounced around the world and I and I felt that the Gulf's extremity was very much a yeah, could be potentially a, yeah, a, um, almost like a, a precursor to something that I was worried about at the time. And it had a lot to do also with um, the sort of like projected fantasies, especially of like old white men in the middle of the 20th century, sort of like what their dreams of the future were, like big skyscrapers and um, sort of, uh, you know, shop beautiful shopping malls that you could get lost in for days, kind of a thing. And it was it was very much also about architecture because I think the Gulf is a it, the Gulf isn't the only place in the world where there's this sort of like playground for architects, but it is very much um, uh, I guess star architects think of it as a blank landscape, and so that's why we have so many kind of insane uh, examples of that. So this is really the reason. Uh, or the link. Great. Why don't we move along to um, Shengzi? Oh. oh, well, me because actually while I was making this film, I never you know, thought um, about it like this way because live streaming, um, this media really is about being present. It's about the present um, because um, because not just because. Um, um, because that you are being watched uh, or you are watching someone doing something. It's also because of the interaction um, between the anchors and the fans. So that's uh, basically the host and the audience. So so it's really about um, the, you know, real-time interaction and the instant, you know, content created um, in, this, uh, in this medium. And that's what I'm um, interested. Um, so, but I do think, well, um, this film in terms of um, future result or future is really because I'm, I'm interested in exploring how um, human relationship or um, human connection being transformed, um, you know, by technology. Um, like, like what we are doing now that, you know, virtually in this virtual, um, well, Zoom meeting room um, that we, you know, chat and we interact and we share our thoughts and ideas with the audience and the audience we probably would never meet offline. Um, so that's what I'm really interested in, um, you know, um, exploring uh, in this film, um, because in China live streaming, um, has become a you know um, very very important um, gathering space for millions of netizens and in America too because live streaming is very popular here too and this is especially important for people who don't have access to uh, you know to the outside world or who don't have access to other people in their in in their real life either because of their disability or because of their identity or just simply because of uh, where they live because if you live in a countryside you really you know you, you you might be feel struggle, uh, you know, going to the house to other place and uh, finding you know other people to simply just to chat to. So um, and also I think it, um, it's also about how we can use technology to um, assert selfhood. So um, I guess for most of us we don't feel it this way, but for people who um, 
have a disability or who are struggling with face-to-face -face interaction, um, they still have this desire or need to get connected with other people. So for them, technology really helps them, you know, to share their, you know, imperfect life with others. Uh, if not finding a community, they at least, uh, you know, <coughs> being seen by using technology. So yeah, so that's, I guess, the link to officialism in a way, yeah. Thank you. That's wonderful. Wonderful articulation of your film. Uh, Larissa and Soren. Well, I think that um, um, I think in, in both of the films, it's um, mostly about lost futures. I think when you uh, when you um, understand it from the point of view of um, the Middle East and the Palestinian condition, uh, it becomes uh, clearer. Um, the film, especially in vitro, talks about anticipated memory and what that means um, in the framework of the Anthropocene. Um, so when we think of all the damage uh, of occupation or man-made uh, um, disasters uh, and the fact that uh, climate change is imminent, um, the rest of the structures that we are constantly dealing with um, and um, um, the rise of nationalism around the world become uh, issues addressed in that framework of uh, of the Anthropocene and what what it would mean to actually think of of the Earth without us as running it, uh, even though we are the ones who are causing the disaster. But the the idea of how uh, geology then takes on that memory and um, um, so the film addresses. Um, um, I guess um, uh, collective memory, personal memory, also state memory, and then uh, goes on to talk about uh, planetary, you know, memory. Um, so in that sense, it it is talking about the um, this future scenario of um, how, or how can we kind of approach uh, present day politics from that uh, uh, futuristic uh, futuristic launching pad. Um, yeah, I don't know if you want to. It's, yeah, it's, uh, no, there's I, a lot to talk about. I'm, I'm, what I'm thinking is that, I mean, one thing that we always sort of remind ourselves is that Palestine, we always see as some kind of accelerated microcosm when it comes to sort of things that are to come for, for, for all of us, for all of humankind. And we're talking specifically politically, nationalistically, we're talking climate change, we're talking everything. That everything is sort of accelerated in, in Palestine, very literally, because you know, let's take agriculture, it's accelerated in its decline because, you know, you have no access, you are surrounded by a, a wall, this kind of thing, uh, factors uh, related to uh, occupation has uh, destroyed many aspects of, uh, of, of Palestinian life. So we always tend to see uh, Palestine as, a, a, as this accelerated microcosm, which means that we're already somehow in the future when we go to Palestine and that future per se is always heavily documented, meaning we, we Palestine is something that's been the object of documentary for as long as anybody can remember, which means that that dialogue is very much is sort of the, the semi-futuristic dialogue is already part of the present. We're always talking about the statehood to come. We're always negotiating Palestine's future, which I think is one of the starting points for us thinking, well, if we want to sort of not just be immersed in the current political dialogue and dictated to by topics that seem to have taken front uh, seat, we need to remove ourselves temporarily even further uh, uh, and, 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 and take with us only what we feel is necessary to discuss. I think that that's sort of the origin maybe of the futurism that we are yeah, I think it was uh, quite shocking that uh, w when we made the film, we were talking about a speculative uh, scenario. And uh, then uh, now we find ourselves all of a sudden in during the pandemic, uh, really living um, a, a sci-fi of sorts, like uh, overnight, all of a sudden we're, we cannot go outside and there is a, a real danger of a virus. Uh, and, um, and I think we uh, were currently, we, um, we started working during the pandemic on a sequel to In Vitro, and we decided that we cannot really keep the protagonists in the, the bunker. So the sequel starts with them being freed in a utopia. Um, but it is strange how 
all of a sudden that scenario be became uh, a documentary if you think about our condition now. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that all of your films suggest that the future is here in, in different ways. And I think that's one of the the, the ways that, that um, Tom, I think maybe this is the way that they get, they conceptually work together in a program. Um, uh, Min Hui, uh, how do you respond to this question? Hi, so um, I think for my film, um, uh, Future is uh, somehow is a um, is a narrative structure, in a way, because um, the film deal mostly with uh, what already happened in the past. So it's it's all the um, in a way it's all the memories of the people about uh, their childhood homes and what they have lost, and. Because I refuse to 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 use the reenactment in a way to use the archive footage, so in a way I I I found it it was very difficult to to say what was there, but no longer now anymore, and so I I came to the bond to use the um, the narration from future perspective, because I realize it it can create a a, a kind of uh, poetic distance in time and space, so that um, uh, the um, the narrator in the film and also the the um, the audience when they see the film, they approach the film and the story of the of these people from the perspective from future. It's like um, you're looking back at something, and. And for me, the that 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 sense of being distant is 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 somehow uh, very necessary for this film. It's it also the the way to 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 how to say to to say something. Of course, like we all say, to say something about this present moment, because the film is about the past, but it is told from the future perspective. So, of course, uh, naturally, we come to the point that. Actually, what is happening now, we become the best in the future. So, in a way, um, I yes, I think um, it connects everything, and also it's um, it's a projection. It's it's a, it's a possibility, and and in a way, it's fun to use the futurism element because it's it's like um, you can create many ideas. Uh, in a very minimalist way, um, because nobody know what is what 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 uh, what does it look like in future in a way. Uh, so what you already what, what uh, only what you know is is memories in a way, and you project them into an unknown um, possibilities of uh, what to come. Yeah. Fascinating answer. Um, Let's go I think to that my Maddie. film isn't exactly meant to be so much about the future, but about um, how there are assumptions of places like Southeast Asia and assumptions about places like Laos, where people just assume that we're extremely non-futuristic because we're a developing country, you know, a developing nation. And when the film opens, the assumption is automatically made that this must be present day Lao or a period film where it took place like 50 years ago in Lao because you see a peasant man uh, in the jungle, you know, looking extremely poor, like the perception of Lao. And then when he walks out and you see in the distance, the megalopolis in the background and he has chip implants and there's like sonic jets flying through the sky, then it sort of turns everything upside down. and. I hope that when people view that, they understand that um, the perceptions that they have are not always correct. But I think that the film is more about how we always are in a state of uneven development and reliance, reliance on outside help um, and colonialism or even modern day imperialism because Lao as a nation has never really been independent 450 years ago, we were slaves, then we were colonized by the French. And now, you know, after the regime change, 
we are trying to put our best foot forward, but then we're so, so reliant on foreign aid. And so the development in our nation is so uneven that for me, it's hard to imagine what the future would be, except unevenly developed, like in my film, <laughs> and still um, under a sort of postmodern colonialism or power. <laughs> Oh my God, so fascinating. I mean, the it, it raises the question of the science fiction genre and the tropes that it carries and what they allow us to say about the, the present and you know and 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 our fears, you know, what's so horrifying about the present. Um okay, so I'll move on to another question for everybody. Um you you sort of already each of you in some ways did talk about time. Um but I think it's it's maybe an opportunity to go a little bit further into that, um, because I think that each of the films in this program are concerned with time and, and not just time necessarily as in set in the future or making reference to the past or making reference to trauma and memory and history, but also sometimes the use of archival material or making references, even if they're um, very uh, allegorical to colonialism, um, settler colonialism. Uh, so can each of you talk about what you're doing with this invocation or use of time? You know, some of you have time travelers. Um, uh, Shengzhi, you know, you're, you're very much set in the present tense, but that's about time too. So, um, and, and related to that, do you think that time is something that has not yet been colonized? So that's for everybody. Why don't we start off with, now I see... Um, Minhui, am I pronouncing your name correctly, Minhui? Almost, but it's okay. <laughs> please, please tell me again. Um, you can just call me Wee. Wee, yeah. okay. Yeah. Yes. Uh, we start with me. Yeah. Do you do? Would you like to start? Oh, it's the, it's I don't know. It's a difficult question, uh, but at us, uh, I agree that in in my film. Um, uh, one of the most difficulties that I I met when during editing the film is how to combine different stories. That's that is because they have this different uh, time settings and and yeah, that's 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 not easy, no. <laughs> um, but what I knew, what I know is that. Um, um, like the story of uh, the, um, the the old lady who 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 was born who was born in the cave. Mm -hmm. So what what I knew is that her conception of time is is so different from mine, because she she remember everything so well, even the moments uh, she was born, where she was born, and it, it, it's just like. Um, she was there when she was born, you know, in a way. That, that is impossible for me because I don't know how I was born and when exactly. And so, so, so in a way, I, I try to, in making this film, I try to make it um, logical, the time. The, but um, yeah, because there is the problem of uh, structure and duration. So we talk about time and we also talk about duration of uh, cinema. So, how to how to try to make sense such um, such a complex and intangible time and memory in a very concrete duration? So yeah, I, I talked uh, earlier that that's why I use um, the the, the ca a narrator who who tell the story from future perspective uh, to, to to for me to for the film to have the the reasons to. To, to connect and to jump between different times and space so that it looked like, um, basically it looked like a memory of somebody. And yes, without the, 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 the setting of that narrator in future, I, I think the film will, would, be, would, re, would be remain a, a mess, you know, because uh, anyway, I don't know what I'm talking about. I try to make sense. I think you're making total sense. I think your film is a very, very moving and complicated one. And uh, um, it's very, it tells, brings together different stories and that's its power. 
So we're putting you on the spot and asking you questions and maybe we should just all, you know, you don't have to unlock the, the key, you know, unlock the door for us. But I just curious about this question of time. So um, why don't we move on to, um, to Sophia? Like I think a lot about deep time and how that's, um, I suppose, a non-human, um, not sort of anthropocentric uh, dimension that we happen to exist inside of. And in that way, I do think that uh, a lot of uh, human endeavors such as colonialism appear quite petty. And that in a way is a great comfort, even if it is like, again, at this sort of extremity of, of uh, I guess like perspective. Um, a lot of the work that I've been doing recently is very much around history. I write um, uh, historical fiction um, as a screenwriter. And I spend a lot of time thinking about colonial histories um, in particular. And so in this way, like I, I do think that, I mean, the past or his quote unquote history has already been colonized in so many different ways. And, but we are capable in our contemporary moment of unpicking uh, those revising them um, revisiting thing, events and um, time periods. Again, like I think that um, it's, of course it's impossible to dream the future without really being rooted in the past. But um, yeah, I think, I do think that, um, yeah, time can't, time itself cannot be colonized, but lives can and um, countries can, of course, and even like um, our ways of thinking are so deeply already colonized that it's like a project individually of everyone to redream or escape that sort of crushing gravity of one's own past and one's own history. So um, I think like the decolonization project and projects are also very much on an individual level important in terms of um, moving ahead into some kind of future that feels more just and more livable. If that makes sense. Yeah, beautifully, beautifully put. Um, Larissa and Soren. Um, I like what Sophia said about, yeah, uh, history having been colonized in so many ways and, and in terms of our work uh, being situated often or at least originated or being inspired by the situation in Palestine you know that comes across as very true. Um, I do remember a couple of days ago reading an article about where the, the, the headline of which read, read uh, uh, while the land uh, can be returned time cannot uh, and, and that's a topic that we uh, and talking in a Palestinian uh, context here as well, but probably with a more universal appeal as well that, you know, that's fine. We can rectify and, and redistribute and redraw draw lines. But what I see in, in Palestine as well, whenever we go there, is time being lost. Like we've been working with this uh, we, we, for, for uh, you know, in, in, in in vitro, you have this big black sphere uh, that sort of, become some kind of like generic container for memories and, and a collective personal uh, time per se. And we recreated that as a, an actual sculpture in, in Venice where the film premiered as a, and called that sculpture a monument for lost time because that is very much uh, sort of the Palestinian experience uh, to a certain extent. I, I, see, I see the time lost in a sense like occupation is a, a time theft as well as it's a land theft, an aesthetic theft, it is everything. You know, the, the, the time spent negotiating your day, your time, the waiting, the idling, the, 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 the uh, you know, permits requested, required for this, that, and the other thing, your house is being 
you know, demolished and built up again. It's time, time, time. So, the, you know, that preoccupation with just constantly sort of trying to scale your daily life up to a point of livability is at a, t- a time, uh, sort of a, a colonized time, very almost literally. Yeah. But I also think that if you think about time as homogenous, um, it uh, stops making sense in the uh, Palestinian um, uh, context because um, I think with um, in 1948 with the Palestinian exodus uh, and you know the Palestinian catastrophe when the Israeli state was erected, um, I think it, there was a rupture of that time, and I think it's that's kind of central to what we are working on. Um, where the Palestinians are always kind of remembering this unjust that happened to them uh, in 1948, and always um, um, projecting uh, in the future a future a future Palestinian state. Yet the present uh, is uh, slowly disappearing, and I think part of our thinking about um, having that uh, black sphere in Venice was to make a monument uh, or like a memorial almost for that lost time. This um, uh, so that was, you know, um, part of think, thinking about how time is also completely connected. Um, it's very hard to separate it uh, temporarily um, from, say, the present, from the past and the future. And the blur- blurriness of that time is um, uh, something we play with in, when we played with in, in the future, the eight from the finest porcelain and also uh, in vitro. Yeah, I found that ball also, I read it in a slightly different way, and I thought it reminded me of of an embryo, and I thought, well, I was connecting it to the title of the film In Vitro and the Heirloom Child, or the Heirloom Palestinian Future, and I thought it's a very dark reference to an embryo of something that has, that may not survive even. So I, I, yeah, to me, it was, I was reading on to it. It was adding a layer of, I don't know, bio, uh, I don't know, biopolitics or whatever, but um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Shengxi, how do you respond to this question? Your film is in the present. Yeah, well, but when you see it, it's already in the past, right? <laughs> so yeah, I guess um, the concept of time is like a motive for me that I'm very, very interested in, not just, you know, um, the past, the present or the future that we, um, not like, uh, you know, that, that is like a parallel to our lives or that you or the one that you try to construct in your film, um, but also how time is um, perceived, how time is filled, uh, how time is portrayed and how time is ex- experienced. So anyway, so um, in Present Perfect, um, this film specifically, I'm more interested in real time. So so it's like how you can, um, how one can, you know, instantaneously experience what others are experiencing at that moment. Like, um, like this virtual uh, togetherness really, um, create a sense of being, um, you know, no ma- regardless of where you are um, or what time zone you are in. Because that's what I feel like most, uh, like strongly while I was making this film, because I recorded all the footage here in Chicago, while all the happenings, um, you know, were in China. Um, so I, so actually I didn't consider this film um, as a found footage film or archive film. That actually is the, the very first thing I'm going to say about this film. Um, but I know that once I made it, um, once I, you know, uh, once the film um, is projected on the big screen, um, being watched by the audience, yes, it's a, it has this archival, um, you know, feeling in it. So, and also I think time is not just about uh, past, present or future, but also um, as we just said, it's about duration. So, um, because it, and in cinema especially, because you can easily recount a film with no actor, no music, no dialogue, but you cannot find a film uh, without the sense of time passing. Uh, because that's what it is about, about a moving image. Um, so for me, and, and as a director, as an artist, you can, you know, there are always multiple layers of time in your work. Um, it's, it, you know, you, there is this um, 
the time that you record the footage. So that, and also there's the time that you try to construct in the film. Uh, it can be, you know, in the past or it can be, you know, hundreds of years later at your will. So, so it's very, very flexible. Um, so that's, so these are things that I'm very, very interested in, um, in exploring my work. But as for your question, like by the time is uh, has been colonized, I think, oh, I, I think this is like, a, it's a very, very good question. I'm still thinking and I don't know the answer yet, but if, um, I guess if we talk about time as a, as a dimension of this universe, um, you know, it's not like uh, the past, the history, or the future. It's just time. Um, then probably not, because it's not something that we human beings can conquer. I don't know. That's like my my oh, feeling. <laughs> yeah, it's actually an excellent point. Yeah, um, yeah. I think that's a very important element. That you know, it's not something that we can dominate, even though we try. And I think the surveillance technology that. Um, or the, the surveillance footage that is the basis of your film is kind of um, a, an attempt to to harness time. And uh, I mean, in, in different ways by different peoples, not only the anchors, but the apparatus that surveils people. Um, and, and also about the found footage. A found footage film, it, it, so there are so many different definitions of, well, not so many, but there are different definitions of found footage. Um, but it is footage that is, in an archive, and so the what is the archive? It's kind of loosely defined and you know kind of relative. Um, Maddie, how do you respond to this question about time? Um, I'm just fascinated by all the different reactions because it just goes to show that every individual and every artist is going to have their own relationship with time. You know, mm -hmm. um, the perception and even the cultural way that we interact with time is so different. Because I think um, about conquering time, yeah, okay, we as humans cannot conquer time, but we sure as hell try. <laughs> That's what my whole film is about, is this time traveling old man, a little boy trying to harness the power of time and trying to manipulate time to his benefit. But the reality is um, I do think time is semi-conquered or at least, or not conquered, um, colonized, or at least a portrayal of it is, because one of the main reasons why I wanted to make this film, there are many reasons, but um, one of the reasons why I wanted to make this film was because I feel that the portrayal of time is extremely Western. Um, there's this idea that time should be linear. You know, we are born, we grow up, we walk, we eat, we drink, we die, um, and basta, that's it. We turn to angels, maybe, if we're not like really crappy. But that's not how my culture perceives it. As a Lao person, as a Southeast Asian person, we have so many different ways that we approach time. We have reincarnation, for instance. Um, we have an afterlife and we have what we call um, when someone dies a horrible accidental death by home and they're caught in a cyclical loop. Um, and it's almost moment and trauma and event based that they're trapped in this loop of time. And I haven't, you know, it's not often that you get to see that in stories and in screen because time, the portrayal of time has been so colonized by the Western perception that I figured that we may as well see what a Buddhist time travel serial killer film looks like. <laughs> oh, very rich. <laughs> I'm just trying to check on the time here. Um, it's 2.41, so Tom, I'm thinking of just asking another general question and then opening it up. What do you think? Yeah, that's fine. We don't have anyone typing anything in the Q&A yet, but people okay. feel free to type that in. Okay. Um, I mean, you've kind of, each of you or some of you have kind of talked about these things, but um, what I think is interesting is the... Um, and even Shengji, even in your film, I think this is this is there. I read it in, the, in your film. Um, there's a response to trauma of some sort, past trauma. So I'll leave it at that. That's the general question. How do you how how do you see your work responding to past trauma? And I'm sorry if this is. I feel like some of these questions are 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 um, there may be a repetitive nature to them. Um, but I think that, yeah, 
Okay, so let's just let's start with um, maybe Shengzhi, since you know. Let's start with you um, now. What I notice about your film is that um, the characters, the anchors, some of them are extremely engaging. I especially uh, I like some of them. And um, what I think, what I experience when I watch your film is that it, um, it's in, there's an intimacy alongside a banality, banality of this surveillance footage. Um, but I also think that there are some characters who've had some experience with trauma. Um, and also, I think the fact that people are using this as a means to connect to the outside world is very disturbing. So I'm just wondering, this is just my interpretation of your film. How, what were you thinking of? Do you see the element of trauma or, um, or, or some kind of uh, disaster or some kind of low-grade apocalypse affecting how you shaped this film, your ideas about this film? Mm, well, um, in terms of trauma or um, some like di disastrous, um, you know, that, that sense of, um, well, I, while I was making it or, while, or maybe I should say while I was, uh, I first watching the shows, I didn't have any this kind of um, feelings or, um, because, you know, um, those people, like most of the live streaming shows are about like entertainment. So it's more like, um, you know, dancing, singing. It's like a, it's like a, like a, like a, like a festival, you know, very, uh, so, so, so yeah, but, uh, um, but after I um, watched the shows for several months, I realized, okay, there's this group of people, like a relatively small group of people who are not interested in, uh, you know, just like a pure performance, uh, who, are, who, not, who are not trying to make money out of it, um, but simply try, uh, trying to find a companionship. And uh, with this group of people, um, they some of them they do have like a personal tra trauma, um, you know, in their own experiences um, because they are in certain kind of difficult or um, uh, dreadful situations, you know, like um, either because of their disability or just because of their you know social uh, social and economic status. So um, so yes, from this perspective, yes, there's this kind of um, link to trauma. Um, but at the meantime, I think that, well, because those people, um, they are very, they have very, very strong personalities. You know, um, I mean, why, because for me, like personally, I don't want to show my, share my life with strangers, you know, but they, 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 they are just, even though they are in those very difficult situations, they are willing to share their lives with others, with strangers they would never meet uh, offline. So for me, um, so I think they are not like victims of traumas, they are like fighters. Um, so, and that's what I really, really um, appreciate, yeah. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, I mean, referencing trauma, doesn't imply being a victim, but I, I, I see you, you're, yeah, I see, I see also the characters very engaging and charismatic, even, even though they've had traumatic experiences. Um, okay. Can we move to, let's move to uh, Hui and um, your response to this question of trauma. Uh, feel free also to branch into other things. Uh, we don't have time for all the questions I was thinking of, but I'm also very curious about the, the, the element of the drawing of the house in your film, and also that song by Tai Tran about nostalgia. Um, I thought those, just like the interweaving of these elements, very interesting in your film. Yes, I think um, um, when I made the film, I didn't think so uh, that's, that's something concrete, like you you just say, uh, like used in the term trauma. But I guess the film is start and end, and with with uh, what we cannot forget. So the the film, the starting point of the film is is that that uh, the, some concrete images, some concrete events in our life that we cannot forget, and so. So the the way that uh, the more I try to 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 how to say to to 
to, um, to make the film concrete, I realized that all of the stories of the people, even the song you mentioned about the singer who lived overseas, it's all about um, the, the childhood home, you know, the, the home that all of us lost. Um, so that, that kind of thing, um, but I think uh, the, the loss of home, of childhood home, is not really a trauma, but it's something that is, is, is stuck inside, deeply inside our unconsciousness, because um, there's something that, uh, that we cannot re remember at that moment so vividly, but it's, it keeps, uh, in a way, lingering in our mind and in our dreams, in a way. So that's the, and then the from the, the from the that concept of um, of the lost home of child, childhood home. So it's it it's, it's something that very traditional in that memory and sentimental too. So that's why I use the hand drawing of, of, of my of, of the, the, uh, an image of a house because for me it's very traditional to remember about your childhood home in a way because um, you should forget it, but of course we, 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 we can't not forget. And then along the way with the, the, the characters, especially the, um, the, the old lady who, who, who was born in the cave, uh, with the, her story, suddenly I, I see that the, the idea of home, it is bent to, to, to something that's so universal and, and also, very immemorial, that's the childhood home of, of humankind, which is a cave. So, so of course, this, this theme deal deeply with uh, what we cannot forget in the past. And for me, it's melancholic and it's happy to, 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 to try to think, of, to remember about that, but only in a kind of dream. So for me, uh, if I think that in the term of trauma, like you say, is something that um, uh, really close to imagination, yeah, and dreaming something like that. Yeah. Interesting, and it's so, interesting. Samira, sorry, I don't, I don't mean to interrupt, but we do have a question from the audience. Do you want to uh, go to that now? Yeah, sorry. Sure. Uh, it's a, it's a kind of a complex question, and I guess we can leave each of the filmmakers to decide if and how they want to answer. Uh, more than ten years ago, Apichat Pang Riasatha Kun. This is, of course, the great Thai filmmaker. Uh, describes cinema as the prosthesis for those who cannot see their past lives. I'm wondering what writers, theorists, and cineasts have inspired you. Could you mention a few, if any? So I guess this is the question that uh, any of you can jump in on as you see fit. I love uh, my favorite film on the planet in the whole world is Ratatouille because I thought it was incredible that this rat could live a more full life than even we humans can. And it's not a joke, you guys. Like when you watch this rat living this life, pursuing his dream, despite all the oppression that he, and all the prejudice that he has to face, um, you can't help but get teary and feel so full at heart when he becomes that chef and he has his own restaurant. But anyway, that's my inspiration. But as for like, cinema being a prosthesis for those who can't uh, perceive their past life, according to a Picha Pong. Um, maybe that's kind of an occidental view or for people who um, don't necessarily feel so in touch with the concept of past lives because in Southeast Asia, and this is where I always had a disconnect with um, his work was in Southeast Asia, we are very connected to our supernatural. We are very connected to spirituality. Um, it is not uncommon if your auntie comes to you and says, I experienced a past life or I am so-and-so reborn. Um, we take that very seriously and we really believe it. So we don't necessarily need cinema <laughs> to um, connect us to our past lives. And so perhaps he says that meaning that the rest of the world who is starting to lose their um, grasp on nature and um, I, how do I say this? Their soul and spirituality because of technology, because of futurism and because of modernism. Um, 
might need that, which is kind of ironic because cinema itself is a sort of futuristic mode of storytelling, right? It's sort of a modern way of storytelling. And so I can't help but wonder if this isn't um, a saying for the Westerners when, you know, it's it's great because he does make films that tries to put Westerners in touch with our culture in a, in a form that's palatable to Westerners. Um, whereas for us, it's kind of like, well, we didn't need that. Um, we're already in touch with the concept of past lives and spirituality and all of those, um, all of our traditional beliefs. So I don't know, um, question and answer person, I hope that was helpful. That's just my perspective. <laughs> Can I suggest that we hear from Larissa and Soren? Do you, do you have a response to uh, this question or to? Uh, well, I'm not sure if there is, I mean, the, the problem with me answering this question is that I can't think of what inspired me. Uh, I guess uh, science fiction in the, in the sense, in, in general, inspires me just because it can play with different, um, um, tem with temporality. Uh, but I also think of, um, um, yeah, I'm, find, I'm finding it hard to um, to think of uh, this question as helping me to understand uh, memory. I'd rather think of um, anticipated memory. So, for um, for to kind of understand what uh, are from the future pers uh, from a. Um, Future, future point of view, what uh, would our, our memories uh, look like? And, and so I already kind of, I think about proleptic mourning and uh, of, of things happening now. And, um, and so it's, um, it's the shift of temporality that interests me uh, uh, when we talk about say, uh, cinema helping me, you know, uh, or being uh, prosthesis for understanding uh, the past. Um, but, but to a certain extent, maybe that said, two of the films that we always mention, if if as some kind of inspiration, are um, Tarkovsky's *The Mirror* and uh, Bergman's *Persona*, uh, and and both of those films do carry a sense of both nostalgia, a sense of play on past. Uh, a, a, and, and, and trauma as well. So uh, besides being sort of uh, extremely engaging in all sorts of aspects. So all these, um, and those do, those do point backwards and those do sort of also uh, open up a category for us to dive into and, and always have. There's something quite special about, specifically uh, for us, at least those two, those two films. Yeah, I was thinking of uh, of the similarities of what we're uh, tackling in our films and uh, and watching the Treehouse uh, because of uh, the sense of nostalgia. And then one one of the um, characters says that a revisiting home is uh, uh, re, re, or nostalgia is revisiting home with pain. And it's something that we keep going uh, back to. And then the whole idea of um, the, the fact that we depend so heavily on the image and our understanding of time is uh, very image related and how maybe uh, this, uh, those indigenous people actually uh, understand time differently by the fact that they uh, grew up on the, a historical narrative or like a, a oral history. Um, so it is, yeah, it's, it's, we, I think um, I, I find those connections quite interesting. Yeah, I, I, I also thought, um, I saw uh, Larissa and Soren and uh, uh, Minhui, I, th I saw your work as connected also in, in a way, I mean, quite literally the drawing of the house, but also that I think you just articulated it much better than I can right now, <laughs> Larissa. Um, but I, I also think that um, this question about um, cinema as a prosthesis for those who can't see their past lives, maybe, maybe there is a, a way also, I mean, Maddie, I see your point totally. And then on the other hand, I see that it, cinema can be very, very useful and very helpful in um, 
in articulating that which cannot be articulated in words and dealing with pain. And um, what I learned, Hui, from your film was about something that I had not known about before, first of all. So it, it was informative and educational, but it also, I, from my own experience uh, and knowledge about his, histories of oppressed people and their relationship to trauma, I could better understand or appreciate the characters in your film or the, the woman, the role of the woman in your film and the transgenerational, uh, the, the, the passing down of trauma through generations and how she could never feel at home in the actual dwelling of home, uh, of a building. Um, there's another question here. Did you want to read it, Tom? Sure, yeah, uh, this is from Bella. It says, I was wondering how you balance the sheer scope of your work global setting, infinite time, with the individual stories and emotions? It's kind of an abstract question. Does anyone want to take that one up? I guess that's a tough one to answer. Uh, we, are, we are actually getting close to the end of our hour, but I, want, I, I actually had a question uh, for uh, we and Maddie. Uh, one of the things that inspired me to do this series was that so many of these kind of sci-fi genre hybrid films were coming out of Southeast Asia. We had not only Vietnam and Laos, but we had a film from Thailand, one from the Philippines. We had a compilation of short films that were set all along the, uh, the countries on the um, Mekong River. So, you know, even though Gulf futurism is a category we can discuss and exists, you know, and, and people write and talk about it. I'm wondering if either of you think there's a kind of Southeast Asian futurism kind of bubbling up uh, and, and why so many filmmakers from your region are kind of tackling this, this genre. Man, you go first. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, how to say it? I, I really think um, the, the, the reason for me to talk about future, but not only in this film, but uh, the, the previous one, the short one, even my first, future, my, my, first, uh, my first feature film also talk about future, is that it's a way to, to indirectly criticize and talk about what happening in a way, because um, I'm, I think um, it's creating more filter for, for me as a filmmaker to, to talk about what is happening now by, 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 narrated, by narrating is from the future. Socially speaking, I think um, because you mentioned about um, the, 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 the filmmaker, so I have a friend also a director in that uh, uh, series. So I think um, if we touch something socially and politically in Vietnam, suddenly we, we face to, to the very huge uncertainty because um, uh, it's, 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 it's likely will happen that Vietnam will be underwater for sure. So, so that, 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 the thing that we are sure now. So, um, so, so to face to, face to that uh, uncertainty, like uh, how, how we can deal with that. Uh, like uh, the short film of my friend who, who, who made in the Mekong series. So actually it's the, the story of a, uh, for me, it's a lost couple, a young couple who just travel along the Mekong River and finding a way to sleep. So I, I think that facing the, the, the huge uncertainty like that, it sounds like a science fiction film, but uh, I think uh, it will happen that the whole country, the whole land will be underwater. Suddenly we, 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 we feel the need to, to go back to, to, to what is so, so, so intimate to, to ourselves which for me is uh, my family stories, the, the memory of my family. So because, so in that sense, uh, even my film, even the, the, the previous one, even is a fiction, but for me, it's, there's always the foundation of uh, archiving things that will, will disappear. So yeah, I think, um, yeah, I think in that way. So you've just reaffirmed the value of the archive. <laughs> I think I think every film, even fiction films, there is always the, the idea of uh, there is always the archival element there. The difference is that uh, if you intentionally think is that way or not, yeah. 
Yes. Yeah. Um, I love your friend's film. If it's, you know, the, the Vietnamese black and white one, right? Yeah, it's in color. Oh, it's in color now. Oh, excuse me. I'm sorry. I saw an early version. My husband's one of the producers of that series of shorts. So I saw it um, in many iterations. And I love the dog that's swimming in the beginning. I love that dog. Anyway, um, for myself, I mean, Mekong 2030 was, the directive was to actually imagine the Mekong region uh, in the future. And in terms of whether this is going to become a thing for us in Southeast Asia, um, I'm not sure, I hope so. But the reality is that we as filmmakers in the region do face a lot of challenges and struggles um, in terms of how we can tell a story, being able to tell the story that we want to tell. And to be honest, things like science fiction, um, futurism and genre, like horror, thriller, et cetera, has become a perfect vehicle to be able to express not just what the, the story we want to tell, but also our fears for the future and our present day struggles. And so, I mean, just like in the Cold War, during the Cold War, um, Soviet film had a lot to do with science fiction and futurism because of the same reasons. And so I, as for whether this becomes a trend or becomes a wave um, of cinema for our region, I don't know, but I sure hope so, because there's so many incredible stories to tell here. And there are so many um, feeling like right now we are all in 2020, we all have feelings of uncertainty, but when you live in a developing world country, like we do, um, that uncertainty is like, it looms over you like this foreboding shadow forever. You wonder every day what tomorrow will hold or what our future will hold because as much as we see improvement, it could definitely come crashing down at any day, any time. And so having something like genre film or science fiction or futurism in film um, helps for us to be able to express those, those fears and that uncertainty and so I hope it becomes a thing. <laughs> and Bella, um, I'm sorry, we didn't mean to ignore your question at all. Um, what was it? You had asked about balancing uh, emotion and personal settings in a global scope or at such an infinite scope. The reality is a story is based on characters and interactions and drama. It doesn't matter how huge a scope is or how crazy the sci-fi sci world is. A good story is always a good story and you always have to have characters that people can associate with and characters that people can understand with drama and problems that we experience in daily lives, even if it takes place in 2065 or 2030. So I think for us, um, balancing a huge epic scale isn't such a problem when we're thinking on a personal level, an intimate level of each character and the problems that they encounter. So I hope that helps you, Bella. <laughs> Well, thanks everyone. Since we're getting, uh, we're a bit over time now, I think we unfortunately should wrap things up, even though this is a fascinating conversation and could go on and on. <laughs> but um, so yeah, I'd just like to thank everyone. Thank you, Samira, for moderating. This was a wonderful discussion. Thanks to all of our panelists and um, hope to see you again sometime in the future. Thanks. Thank you.